get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feet. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I'm Dr. Wanda Lee McPhee, and happy to be your host today. We are thrilled to have Dr. Robert Silverman as our guest. Dr. Rob graduated from the University of Bridgeport College of Chiropractic and has a Master's of Science in Human Nutrition. His extensive list of educational accomplishments include designations as a Certified Nutrition Specialist, Certified Clinical Nutritionist, Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist, certified kinesio taping practitioner and corrective ex- exercise specialist as well as a certified sports nutritionist he is a diplomat in the american clinical board of nutrition and the chiropractic board of clinical nutrition he is a full-time practice in white plains new york where he specializes in the treatment of joint pain with uh, innovative science-based non-surgical approaches and functional nutrition he is also the prestigious 2015 Sports Chiropractor of the Year Award recipient from the American Chiropractic Association Sports Council. And this year, he published a number one bestseller, Inside Out Health, A Revolutionary Approach to Your Body. And today, we are thrilled to talk to Dr. Rob about his new book. Welcome. How are you today? Thanks for having me. Great. We're uh, thrilled to bring your message to our listeners. Um, We've got all kinds of exciting things to talk about. Um, but let's start just first getting to know you a little bit more. So, Dr. Rob, tell our listeners a little bit about you, how you got into this career of chiropractic and nutrition and, and why you decided to write a book. You know, um, it's real funny. I grew up, at, you know, you can't see me, but I have what we call congenital torticollis. You being a chiropractor know what that is. And uh, it's not something that's popular. And um, growing up, there was no options in the medical model. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we had gone to the, we being my parents and I, they took me to the medical doctor. They said there wasn't anything that could be done. Then ultimately they wanted to actually cut the SCM and part of the scalenes, yuck, right? Mm -hmm. And pull on them. And, uh, it was this whole thing and my mom didn't want me to do it. And the simple reason was she didn't want me to walk around with a scar. So at 18 years old, we tried chiropractic care and much to my chagrin, almost comically now, uh, it was probably the worst experience I had at that point with a doctor in my life. Um, that actually was also a family member. So um, I was sort of off chiropractic, not your typical chiropractic story. Uh, I was a Division II walk-on basketball player and injured my back. And at the time, the athletic trainer just wasn't cutting it. And my roommate, who actually was the star of the team, said, try chiropractic. So um, I gave it a whirl again. And um, I can tell you that every time I think about that meeting with that chiropractor, the Mark Twain quote comes to mind, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you knew why. Man, I got off that table and I knew I wanted to be a chiropractor. I immediately started to take the prerequisites, even though I was an accounting major at the time. I mean, he just spurred me on. And the reason he did was it was such a beautiful approach to helping the body heal and heal from the inside out. He talked about nutrition. He uh, gave me adjustment. He told me how I could exercise and rehab. And remember, that's literally 30 years ago, virtually to the day. So um, you know, I went on to chiropractic school. And um, as most of us know, chiropractic school or any kind of um, healthcare discipline is a large commitment. And I can tell you at that point, going to chiropractic school, I just... Whew, uh, what was the best student that I could possibly be, and uh, I wanted to help people grow. I, I know you'd asked about why a book. Well, I, I became a chiropractor, clearly, as I just stated, because I wanted to help people, and you do that in private practice, and that was great. And um, after about 10 years, I decided I wanted to, uh, and I was asked to public speak and talk about what went on in my practice. So now your message gets to the doctors, and that's fabulous. You know, for every doctor that you touch, they can help 30,000 people in their lifetime. And that, that's a large amount. And as that went on, I, I hit the 15-year uh, mark in practice, and somebody said, you know, you need to document this in a book, um, and then you just get to more people and get your message out. And the message I wanted to get is how we can heal the body from the inside out. I think the model that we have now, especially here in America, I know you guys are up in Canada, is that too much or too many practitioners are looking at the body from the outside in and we have to look from it that's the name of the book inside out because we need to have a system approach to healing the body not a system 
approach because as long as we do symptoms it's like putting a bullet a band-aid on a bullet wound and we've sort of moved from inside the body to literally we just coined it and art it root cause resolution mm -hmm. absolutely we talk a lot about root cause when we're talking with experts because really it is clear that our society is getting sicker just dealing with the symptom masking and uh, I don't think it matters what country around the world we've got listeners in 97 countries and that is such a common theme you know putting a patch on there putting a band-aid on there covering up the engine light and waiting for it to blow up isn't working so getting to the root cause is really a key thing um, which is of course why we wanted to have you on today fabulous absolutely and I can tell you that if people patients start to look at it that way and require that from the doctors because I'm speaking to the patients now believe it or not mm -hmm. you're gonna have a change in health and of course the docs I mean we're there that you wouldn't have this podcast look at the amount of people you have it's fabulous so they're interested in that and that's where healthcare should go and hopefully continues to go when you look at where I'm from um, healthcare costs are just rising and people are just getting sicker chronic disease um, the definition of chronic disease is um, a condition you have for three months or longer that won't be cured by a vaccine or medicine. How's that for a definition? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that leaves us pretty broad, doesn't it? Yeah. Unequivocally. Absolutely. Well, it's um, it's great that you finally found your way to chiropractic because, of course, root cause has been a concept of chiropractic right from the beginning. It's it's too bad your parents didn't find it when you were a baby because that torticollis when you're a baby is a whole different deal than when you're 18. But, um, but you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and hopefully now you've had an opportunity to educate so many people that that won't happen to somebody else. Uh, I, I agree, and, you know, it, it enables me really to have that empathy for the patient when they have an injury and they look at you, you don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So with your book, um, the first chapter, you talk about the gut, and, you know, that is such a key piece of health. And, and I think more and more people are realizing this. So tell us why, in your opinion, the gut health is so important. Uh, it's a great place to start. The gut, 70% of your immune cells are in your gut. I mean, that's worth saying twice. 70% of your immune cells are in your gut. Uh, the medical model spent the 20th century killing all the bacteria and killing all the organisms in your gut. In the 21st century, we're spending time just repopulating it. Uh, other than the immune cells being in your gut, it's also the house for nutrient absorption. So I always ask my patients, what have you done for your guts lately? Do you have the guts to be healthy? Have you taken an antibiotic? Of course, everybody has. 70% of Americans have taken one antibiotic, and I think it's 53% have taken five or more. So clearly, we've taken these drugs, which at, at some point, not just prophylactically, were needed, but we haven't repopulated the bacteria. Um, what's most interesting about the gut is that a failed gut, I have something in the book called Dr. Rob's Gut Matrix. So if we have failing gut health, if we have something called dysbiosis, dysbiosis is an unleveling of the good and the bad bugs, or if you will, the good and the bad bacteria, that can lead to tremendous deleterious effect throughout the body. So if you have failing gut health as an overview, you're going to have an overload of toxins to your liver. If you have failing gut health, you're going to have a higher incidence of obesity, insulin resistance, prediabetes, muscular skeletal health. So the gut will release what we call MMPSs, matrix metalloproteinases. I'm not trying to get too technical. Those are the body's own proteolytic enzymes that come out at the time of injury, and they actually wear away healthy collagen and fibrocartilage. The gut will release extra cytokines, which are the stimulus at the receptor side of the cells for NF-kappa B, NF-kappa B being the signal transducer for inflammation. And finally, one of the bigger takeaways, and we can talk about this throughout uh, the podcast, is if your gut is compromised, your brain is compromised. Remember, it's the vagus nerve. This is just a brief overview. Ner um, elevator up, vagus nerve, brain elevator down. The cut is so important that they call it the second brain, and it's so important it was given its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system. Absolutely, and that is really a key thing for people to understand when we're talking about chronic diseases and, and a perfect place to start. 
So one of the ways that people address their gut health um, often is supplements. And I know you feel that natural supplements are a key in healing joint injuries, dealing with arthritis, and, and maintaining bone and, and tissue health. So why do you use natural supplements? And why is that better than drugs for dealing with these kind of injuries and issues? Well, once again, I had a patient yesterday, and she's had a gut compromise. She's got IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And she had four or five years of drugs and was not able to get any kind of resolution, even symptom resolution with the drugs. Because once again, unfortunately, the drugs, we use the term downstream and upstream, but they're downstream. Essentially, the drugs are pointed at shutting pathways off and just curing the symptom. They're not pointed in enabling the body system to function better. So the natural supplements, I find a great venue and option for people who want to rebuild their gut. So there's this basic program, it's a great little acronym, you know, you gotta be catchy in practice. I call it the six R's. So those R's are you wanna remove. What do you wanna remove? You wanna remove pathogens. There's a two way um, idea on how to do that. Remove pathogen, one is change your diet and lifestyle. That is the first thing that I recommend and I'm sure you do also for every patient. Change your lifestyle, lifestyle being diet, exercise, your environment, stress levels, and the like. So we remove, for instance, things that may cause irritations, a pathogen like gluten, dairy, sugar, sugar, which is a toxin. And then you change your diet. You're going to obviously give them this kind of diet and up their ante, if you will, with fiber, both soluble and insoluble fiber. But when you want to remove it, there's also some specific nutrients that I find to be very effective to remove the bad bugs. One that comes to mind is berberine, berberine HCL, a great choice. Some others are aromatic oils. So that sort of takes care of the first R. The second R is to replace. Replace what? Digestive enzymes like HCL and some protease lipase and amylase. Help the patient start digesting because if you've got a problem with your stomach, you clearly have a digestion problem. I'm a big proponent on the third R, which is re-inoculate. re, re with good bacteria, or if you will, probiotics. The takeaway there is genus, species, and strain. Lactobacillus, genus, and species. Strain, something like NCFM. The probiotics that we would recommend, as you do, are strain-specific. And you also very much want to ensure that they have an expiration date, they come from a third-party certified company and the like, but you want to get the good bacteria in. The fourth, which is usually the longest and you know a little bit of the most arduous, is regenerate. You've got to regenerate the gut lining. And a lot of people just go gluten-free and that's great, but if you don't regenerate the gut lining, that poses an issue. So there's a vast amount of nutrients that you may want to use in what we call a medical food to enable your gut lining to heal. Finally, you want to retest the patient. You want to see if they've got clinical outcome. There's a whole differentiation. I mean, I was just speaking with one of the leading immunologists yesterday, and the bottom line is if you have what we call leaky gut, which I just introduced, leaky gut at the tight junctions takes that epithelial cell six months to heal. Patients don't want to hear that. And if you have autoimmune at the gut, it's 12 months. So you're going to be regenerating for a while. Nevertheless, you're looking in the fifth R to retest and see that they've got some clinical outcome. And then, of course, the sixth R is retain. You want to retain gut health and continue to improve the health as we go. But with this new literature, it really changes our timetable greatly. Um, if you don't mind, that's one of the things that I really want to talk about in that not just the overall idea of fixing the gut, but now we have to differentiate it. Is it just dysbiosis, a little unleveling of good and bad bugs? Is there damage at the tight junction which holds the gut together? Or is the gut having an autoimmune response at the gut level which is going to take longer to regenerate? Absolutely. We've, we've worked through this whole series um with our daughter who's 16 and she was having, you know, odd symptoms, looked a little bit anemic, but it wasn't that, um, all kinds of, of blood work that showed up, had a functional um, chiropractor, nutritionist look at it like yourself. 
And it was very much that. It's now 12 months that we've been working on that treatment, or 11 months, um, and it really has made a tremendous difference. But you do have to be patient and persistent. So many people will do this for two or three months and think, oh, I'm not getting anywhere, and they give up, and they go back to eating the crappy foods, or they stop taking the supplements they need, and the regeneration never happens. So they're on that yo-yo over and over and over again. Um, so I hope those people listening to this really listen to that piece of it, that that regeneration, that six to 12 months minimum um, is so essential. That's in a 16-year-old. Can you imagine in a 66-year-old? Unbelievable. And, you know, I can tell you one thing. You know, if you start doing just some gut health in your office or if you have a, a gut issue, it's a life-changing moment. So what I usually say is gut on fire, brain on fire. What do I mean by that? Very easy. Ask all my patients, do you get gas and bloating after you eat? And most people will say yes. That's a sign that your gut is compromised because your gut has no pain fibers. So the only way it can let you know a symptom is, is a sign that something's wrong with the system, they give you gas and bloating. If you know how a lot of people, I get to lecture all the time, 45 minutes after lunch, they go into what they call a tryptophan moment. That means their brain membranes is compromised because they have a brain fog and they've got dulled neural support going to the brain and serotonin which houses in the gut 93 percent of it gets converted through gut inflammation to tryptophan and there's no pain receptors in the brain so gut on fire means brain on fire it's as simple as saying do you get some bloating after you eat within an hour do you get tired you've got the whole compromise of the gut and the brain membranes and the trickle-down effect is, is massive. As that gut lining is inflamed, you can't absorb other key nutrients, so you become deficient in all kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, it, it is quite the cascade. I'm really thrilled to have your, your book explain that so well for people. So toxins. That's, that's one of the chapters in your book, I think, chapter three. So you say it's a toxic world. I totally agree. Can you elaborate on that for our listeners? Absolutely. The CDC has done studies and found that children, once they're born, once they're born, have uh, exposure to about 272 toxins. Here's a great example for you and I. Healthcare products or beauty care products, whatever you want to call them, the average American uses nine. So let's go through myself this morning to get ready for this podcast. Um, real simple. Uh, shampoo, conditioner, gel, hairspray. That's four. Soap, that's five. Toothpaste, six. Moisturizer, eye moisturizer. I'm at eight already. Deodorant, nine. So the average American uses nine beauty care products that exposes them to 123 chemicals, which all can be absorbed in your body within 26 seconds. We live in a toxic world. 26 seconds. Uh, you want to talk about toxins? Just think about... Um, Toothpaste. Again, toothpaste is a great choice. A lot of, lot of toxins in there. And it's number one ingredient, gluten. Lipstick. Hadn't didn't put on any today. Nevertheless, lipstick. Lots of people wear, say they're gluten-free. Gluten's in lipstick. So um, the CDC has done a lot of different studies. Uh, uh, one that really comes to mind is the uh, chemical or the toxin acrylamide. Did you have Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks today? I made mine at home. Coffee is the most consumed beverage in North America. With that being said, coffee when it's burnt, like Starbucks, like Dunkin' Donuts, like the gas station coffee, releases acrylamide. Now, in addition, coffee is the third most sprayed crop behind cotton and tobacco. So now you're getting toxins, herbicides, and the like with acrylamide everybody's toxic by 8 a.m. Absolutely. Now, I have my own list, so I'm curious to see how that compares to you. When we recommend people take toxins out of their, their daily beauty and body care routine, number one for me has been deodorant, and number two mm -hmm. is toothpaste, and number three is shampoo. Now, what do you think about that order? Do you have something else you suggest? 
I, I like that order. I mean, you know, I travel. I, I've got my bags right in front of me over here. I'm going to be traveling tonight after practice. Luckily, it's in the Northeast, so I get to stay here on Friday. And everything I'm carrying is is chemical-free and organic. Absolutely. If I were to use the hotel stuff, I'd be toxic. But the problem is <laughs> if you have a boarding pass, if you have a newspaper, if you read a magazine, if you read my book, it's BPA, another toxin, which is in the paper. If you use a Canadian and American currency, it's BPA. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys have BPS, which is no different. It's yeah. the same endocrine disrupting chemical in BPS that's in BPA. So I agree with you. I think that we should all watch the toxins as much as we can, but it really bodes to the concept that we need to detox both in the spring and the fall, period, and then the discussion. It's unfortunate. Yeah, well, that is the reality of the world we live in. I mean, I... I I think it's not an excuse for us not to try. You know, we can reduce as much as possible, but um, but we are probably never going to hit ground zero on that. No, not in our lifetime, and that's unfortunate. And, you know, a lot of times we hear the expression, the generation behind us, this is the first time where we live, is in worse shape, and part of it is because of the health and the toxins, and we really need to educate the parents, the doctors, and of course, hopefully they all take care of the children so they can have a more health oriented life. And this is one of the biggest problems, the concept of toxins, overload of toxins and those toxins overloading the liver and damaging the gut. Absolutely. And both of these, both the, the gut health we talked about already and then this toxic load that you're adding to the gut um, creates inflammation. And inflammation is a word that people talk about all the time. Somehow it's become almost a benign sounding word in people's minds. They don't realize how significant the word inflammation is. You know, we pop an anti-inflammatory and we think it's all going away. In fact, their latest science says that after two weeks of taking anti-inflammatories, you're more inflammatory than you were before. Um, so prolonged use of anti-inflammatories is counterproductive. Um, some fairly recent stuff, but I think maybe in another 15 years, that'll trickle down, it takes 15 years for most medical science to actually hit the ground. Um, but what can we do about this chronic inflammation on our own? It's a great point. Again, lifestyle is going to be the key component. Change your food around. Food is a potentiator for inflammation. So again, stay away from fried foods. There are specific foods that are inflammatory, gluten, shrimp, dairy sugar is a toxin let's avoid sugar sugar may be the biggest culprit i would say if i had to take two things out in a diet it would be sugar and gluten very basic stuff um to speak to your point about inflammation um it was on the cover of time magazine 2004 it was called the secret killer as a chiropractor if i had to do anything if my arms are tied behind my back i would treat inflammation immediately going for the gut to speak to the um, anti-inflammatories, Aleve, Advil, Ibuprofen, NSAIDs, if you will, non-steroid anti-inflammatories, to piggyback on what you said, they do decrease pain, but they impair healing, whereas the nutraceuticals that you and I talk about and purport decrease pain, but promote healing. Aleve, Advil, those anti-inflammatories don't allow for muscles to heal. They don't allow for cartilage to heal. They don't allow for bone to heal. So they cascade joint pain. But maybe something bigger within that is that they also provide the host with leaky gut. That damage to the stomach, that damage to the intestinal lining that will give them systemic inflammation. Something that was coined after that is called meta-inflammation. Meta-inflammation is that we're all inflamed, but it's a low-level inflammation, but it's not a communicable disease, but it's the leading reason why we're having failing health. Sugar is a toxin which can lead to inflammation. I know I threw a lot out, but um, inflammation is a key component. The first thing I try and do is fix people's gut and get their inflammation down, whether it's just chiropractic or functional medicine slash functional nutrition. Well, and I think you've given everybody really the first step, the sugar, the gluten, and the dairy. I mean, those are the three biggest gut toxins. There's oodles of evidence, and I think that probably would be one of the few things that most clinical nutritionists and functional medicine specialists could agree on, that those are really absolutes for most people. So if everybody started there, they could set the ball in motion for 
you know, starting to regenerate or at least stop the damage of what's happening to their to their gut. So great starting point. Yeah. Sorry. So one of the things that you talk about in your book too, and and certainly, although it's always been a a, a, a comment about the American you know obesity issue, I can tell you as a Canadian that that issue is just as rampant here and I'm sure around the world this the growing challenge of obesity um, so people go on a diet and on average gain three pounds what can they do instead it's true most diets fail and um, yes America is number one in obesity the average male is um, I think it's 40 percent now American males are obese 15 percent worldwide 35% of women are obese. Worldwide, it's 11. We are number one, we being in America, number one heavy or obese country in the world. Canada is number three. So, you know, you're not far behind us. We're, catch- so we're land- catching up. We're catching up. You're catching up. <laughs> um, don't copy us on that, if you will. Um, the Lancet has spoke about uh, worldwide obesity has not decreased in 33 years. No country has decreased their obesity. Uh, most diets fail because a diet to most patients is a jail term. The first thing they have to remember is it's a lifestyle. It shouldn't be a diet. New literature that's come out, we talked about it a little bit before. It takes about 12 months of a lifestyle change to change the way your brain releases hormones. So if you're going on a vacation and you want to lose 10 in three weeks, you can do that. But like you said, most people are going to gain it back. So some of the easy parameters, I don't count calories. It is an antiquated. So I always use it's a thousand calories of broccoli does not equal a thousand calorie frappuccino from Starbucks. I don't count calories. What I do count is I count chemicals, not calories. I count nutritional value, not calories. I count satiety, not calories. I count body composition, not body weight. So that's some of the things that people out, and it's a big change. And they're like, well, I looked at Weight Watchers, and they said 1,300 calories. And I'm like, it's not the same if you eat a bunch of Snickers bars versus uh, turkey and broccoli. And that's something that needs to resonate, and that's the switch that people need to switch. You you said 15 years. I heard 17 years that the doctors don't switch, and this is not here to, to bash them. The bottom line is – the public's mantra doesn't understand where the leading edge material is and that's about the chemicals and the value of the food the organic versus these pesticide laden meals well one of my partners in in this podcast dr michael lack and and i'm not telling tales out of school here but he'd be happy to chip in that at this point he's lost over 100 pounds uh, changing his lifestyle to a, a more paleo-based, no gluten, no sugar, um, pretty much no dairy, uh, bulletproof coffee, intermittent fasting, more exercise, uh, and it is a absolutely future-changing way of living. So it works. I, I concur, and um, that's great. You know. Um, all these diets that we talk about that, you know, paleo, paleo, terranian, uh, pegan and, and the like, when you really think about it, it's a non-processed food diet, which really goes back to what Jacqueline said. If man makes it, I won't eat it. Good point. Yeah. And, and it really, it cuts down on the fast food. It cuts down on the junk food or, or eliminates entirely. Um, and like you said, it is, it, it really forces you into making your own food and making healthy food, choosing more natural food and the chemical and toxic load, like we were talking about earlier, which is in so many of those types of processed foods or prepared foods, we're automatically dropping. Uh, so that's great on many fronts. Agreed. So one other thing, and I sort of touched on it when I, when I spoke about Dr. Mike there is movement, you know, people are not moving enough. We know that sitting is the new smoking. Um, It's a huge huge lifestyle factor in our health. So how can people get more movement, more proper motion into their daily life? Well, you're right. I mean, sitting is the new smoking. I mean, uh, we sit almost 30% of our life, which is about 26,000 days from the Reebok study. 
We look at technology, 41%, and we exercise 0.69%. So people have to understand movement is life. The difference between a live body and a dead body is that at some point, even if it's at sleep, that live body will move. So movement is beautiful, though it is extraordinarily complicated. So I try and get all my patients to exercise. I'm not asking for an 800-pound deadlift. I'll take a 10,000 steps a day. I'll take a four-minute Tabata. We've got to get people to move. We, we're a very sedentary society, and that leads towards why part of the reason that we're very obese and overweight. I mean, we take exercise for granted. We take the concept of quality movement for granted. If you have a break in a movement pattern, you release more acid from that than you would on any food. And that's some of the things that I try and elucidate to a lot of our functional medicine doctors in that even if you're just doing nutrition, you've got to look at the patient's posture and movement patterns because I'm a big believer that manual rehab and part of manual rehab is a functional movement assessment plus nutritional biochemistry will ultimately lead to optimum health. Well, and one of the things you touched on there, I think maybe some of our listeners could grab on to one of the excuses, and I'm going to call it an excuse that I hear, and probably some people are saying to themselves in their brain right now is, I just don't have time. I just don't have time. I don't have an hour to go to the gym. I can't do that. I can't add another hour into my day. But like you mentioned right there, we could add a four minute movement sequence or get up and do a couple of stretches every hour. Uh, it doesn't have to start as a great big chunk of time, maybe. No, I mean, even just doing um, a stretch like you said every 20 minutes at the computer station will really help with failing posture, the round shoulder, this, the head coming forward, anterior head carriage, and the like. And if you think about it, I'm asking for 15 minutes. That's 15 minutes out of your day. There's nobody that doesn't have 15 minutes. I mean, I've literally exercised in the corner in airports. I've literally walked up and down the plane just to keep movement. They think I'm nuts, but I'm not where I think they're nuts because I just see a lot of people laying there doing nothing and wasting the time. And I walk back and forth. Um, hotel rooms. So you don't need to carry a gym with you. As long as you have a floor, a floor and a wall, you can do something. Absolutely. That's that's a wonderful thing. 15 minutes. If people could just add that to their target count for their day, um, revolutionary. So one of the other things you talked about in terms of treatments is a low, laser la low level laser therapy. Um, you use that in your practice. You've used that with your athletes. Um, some people have probably heard of that. Um, we're not a big modality-based clinic. We're mostly hands-on and nutritional lifestyle counseling as well, but we do have a low-level laser as well. So tell our listeners a little bit about laser therapy. Absolutely. I'm, I love my laser therapy. And the reason I love it is I get such great results with my patients. I love it from the practitioner perspective because, you know, as you know, manual therapy can be hard on the practitioners. I treat a lot of athletes. Some of these uh, guys and gals are big, especially these 320-pound linemen. I'm 186 pounds, so sometimes my joints and muscles get strained a little bit if they move in <laughs> the wrong way. Laser is a point-and-shoot type of object. It's based on Einstein's law of physics, and it essentially, if you're using one of those low-level lasers like we talked about, I'm a conier guy myself you are enabling the body to heal from the inside out. So what's happening is light is being sent and absorbed in the skin through the cell membrane. Now circle that cell membrane because we will come back to that. The cell membrane takes it in and puts it into the cell. The cell stimulates mitochondrial, ATP, oxygenation, and neurotransmission. Essentially, low-level lasers should stimulate cellular healing. And when it does that, muscles get stronger, wounds heal quicker, and you get a great nerve impulse or an increased nerve impulse. So for me, I couldn't practice in my office without laser therapy. In addition, I know hopefully we'll get to it, I'm using laser therapy a lot with concussion, and I know I think we're going to get to that. The reason I circled the cell membrane is a lot of people call me up and said, hey, Dr. Rob, I followed your protocol, patient X didn't respond. Well, 
if it's LeBron James, who's the greatest basketball player in the world right now, myself, who's a middle-aged chiropractor who tries to stay in shape, and my dad, who's 86, who's ready for his second hip replacement, who in God's name do you think cell membrane will absorb that light better? LeBron, myself, or my dad? Probably in the order that I just mentioned. So we always, especially you doing your functional medicine and nutrition concepts, you always want to keep the cell membrane in the body healthy, a cell membrane health, omega-3 fatty acids, alpha-lipoic acid, and the like. So for me, once again, laser is a great modality. It's extraordinary, versatile, and I think it's the most versatile healthcare modality of the 21st century. And I think what we like about it and, and probably brings back to our original discussion around root cause is we're actually getting to the cell. We're not just making it feel better. We're not just numbing a tissue or numbing a nerve or creating a little bit of a temporary treatment or symptom relief, we're actually getting to the root cause, creating new cells from damaged cells. Um, and that's that's really one of the few, or if only, modalities out there that can really do that. I concur. And I think that was a great way of describing that so much. So I just wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble. There we go. There we go. So that's this is the part I'm really interested in talking about here. We do a lot of pre-season concussion screening with with young athletes, hockey players here, football, soccer, baseball, you name it. Um, and then of course, as a consequence, there's always injuries and you do end up with managing uh, a number of, especially in our case, young people who have suffered for a concussion and anything we can do to make that happen better, faster, stronger is, is something I'm always up for. So I wanna hear your breakthrough approaches that you've got in managing concussion injuries. Well, one, you know, um, the diagnosis of concussion, the, F, uh, the FDA finally at the end of August, I think it was August 24th, which was uh, reported in Forbes magazine, that the impact and the impact pediatric tests are the only tests now that they recognize. In addition, what I found with concussion is if you hit your head as simply as that, within six hours, you have brain tissue damage. If your gut is injured, through the vagus nerve, you're going to have in six hours zonulin released, and you're going to have tight junction injury in the gut. In addition, other studies have shown in three hours, you're going to have a release of lipopolysaccharides, LPS. So if you hit your head, you're going to give somebody leaky gut, and that's some of the biggest misses that people have. So let me send that out there. Let that settle. Now, what are you pointed at in a concussion? You're pointed at trying to increase the protein enzyme brain-derived neurotrophic factor because that's neurogenesis. Now, what's fascinating about the concept of neurogenesis is very simply up to the last couple of years, if you asked any neurologist, any leading edge medical doctor, neurosurgeon, they would say the brain can't heal. But now we know through neurogenesis and the increase of the protein enzyme, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that is possible. So now that we talked about that, head getting hit, causing a leaky gut, and this whole cascade, because the body's all interconnected as well, we know, let's talk about the treatment. I use a lot of the laser. You know, again, I talked about that Arconia laser. I like that because it's not a heat-oriented laser. It's a class two. So I use that for concussion to help, help the brain heal. In addition, I do a lot of rehabilitation, gaze stabilization, proprioception, and the like. Some of the biggest problems is that we don't rebalance what we call altered motor control in the brain. The person hits their head. They think because they passed the impact test, everything is okay. But yet with that altered motor control, their proprioception and their movement is off. This is evidenced in different studies that have shown college athletes post-concussion have a higher, a considerably higher incidence of lower extremity injury. So that rehab, that musculoskeletal rehab is a key component and nutrition for concussion. So some of the things that I recommend for nutrition for concussion to help with brain derived neurotrophic factor is simply protein high levels of protein help the brain heal creatine creatine is a great choice to get energy to the brain 
uh, magnesium, but it's magnesium L-theranate. It's not magnesium citrate, which is great if you take in a high amount, gives people uh, a cure for constipation. Magnesium bisglycinate is great in that it helps people have higher levels of magnesium, but magnesium L-theranate has been studied and shown to be the only one that passes the blood-brain barrier and get to the cerebral spinal fluid where the bulk of the injury is. In addition, gluto Thione is a great choice. Now, if you take straight glutathione, your stomach acid kills it. So we recommend five to six different nutrients that go through a pathway that make glutathione. It's been shown that the increase in glutathione can decrease brain injury by 70%. Zinc, choline, and your associated B vitamins, and maybe the bigger takeaway, fish oils, DHA, Great for cell membrane health. Remember, DHA, key component cell membrane health, the brain is the fattest organ in the body. So therefore, that DHA, EPA is a great choice. BDNF is the way to go. I have several articles on that. If every, anybody wants that, feel free to email me at info at Dr. Robert Silverman. Or even, if you will, you can go to my Facebook, Dr. Robert Silverman. Like it if you do. Just say, hey, I want those articles. My social media team will get you those articles ASAP. Fabulous. Um, and that is that. And those are practical things that, that people can look at, talk to their doctor about, talk to their chiropractor about, talk to their functional medicine specialist about, and, and get a little bit quicker recovery time and definitely better recovery, which is really the key with concussion, because we know the repeated injuries are cumulative. So the better we can recover from the first one, the less impact we're going to have from the next one. So that is such good advice. Great takeaway there. Great takeaway, what you just so, said. So let's, um, let's look at where you're going to go next. So this is functional nutrition, functional chiropractic, functional medicine. Everybody's kind of um, gravitating, I think, at at a certain level to really looking at this inside out approach to health that you talk about in your book, where is this going to go? I, I think we're at the tipping point. I think we're literally at people's epiphany. I see such a tremendous growth. I think the key component for us is to continue to do exactly what you're doing. Kudos to you. Thank you for doing such a good job. Thank you for having so many followers. I think that we have to be those messengers. I think it's our job to lay the groundwork for other doctors to come in, spread the word to the patients. I can tell you, ask me why I wrote a book. There was one thing I never realized. How many patients would read the book and come in and say, I'm ready. Amazing. I talked about detox with them three, four, and five times. And yet, till they read my book, they never got on with the program. Just remember, in Latin, teacher me, a doctor means teacher. Don't ever stop. Keep spreading the word. It is what we were put here for, and it's one of the greatest gifts in the world to give somebody health. Thanks, Dr. Rob, and thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your um, generosity in giving so much of your, your information to our listeners. Uh, and to me personally, which is which is wonderful. I hope that everyone gets an opportunity to access all of the details of that through your book, Inside Out Health, um, A Revolutionary Approach to Your Body, Dr. Robert Silverman. Do you have a website or anything that we can direct people to, Dr. Rob? Absolutely. Feel free to go to my website, www.drrobertsilverman.com. I did it such so I could remember it. And go to my social media. As you know, social media is big. We wouldn't be on here if there wasn't. And that's drrobertsilverman.com. Like it. We do our Facebook Live. Um, we're getting a lot of followers. And every week, Tuesday, we're going to be doing a Facebook Live. And guess what? We're going to be talking about probiotics. Fantastic. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. As you know, at Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast, we are committed to bringing you amazing experts, resources, and tools to help you live your best. So check out our website as well, www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com for more. Please register for our weekly health and wellness newsletter. And if you know someone who needs to hear what we talked about today with Dr. Rob, please send them the link, iTunes, Podomatic, and many of your favorite online podcasting uh, apps carry our podcast for free so if you know someone who could use this information please share and until next time know that you hold the keys to your health so be well thank you